Very good. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, Udo just said let's do a chat, a Q&A. But um, I thought it would be useful to provo pro provoke you a little bit um, and just walk you through, in a sense, a set of influences that have, uh, have happened to me uh, since I was your age, since I was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and uh, you know, to where we are today, and to also just help to. Um, characterize for you this this thing we call landscape urbanism and and so how how do we get to this idea of landscape urbanism now, I'll, I'll whiz through it really quickly it's really more of a little um, a little journey but I hope that it will inspire you to then ask some smart questions and to think about um, to think about things so it should be thought-provoking um, so this is Manchester where I grew up and it was a city, uh, a city with a lot of bad weather, bad clouds, uh, a tough city where you sort of had to be able to fight for yourself on the one hand, but also a city where um, music was prevalent in the 80s. This is uh, the Smiths. And you, you heard the Smiths? Just hands up. No? Oh, uh, Udo. <laughs> Uh, you know, Smiths, U2, the police, they were just young guys at the time playing at the school. And uh, soccer, of course, and, um, you know, in Manchester at the time was a burgeoning arts and culture and fashion uh, and music uh, culture. So it was a great city in the, in the early 1980s. And at the same time, just about an hour outside of the city was some of the most beautiful countryside ever. Uh, on, the, on the one side was an area called the Peak District, and just north of that was the Lake District. And big mountains and valleys and lakes and streams and glaciated um, landscapes. And uh, I was really into this too. So I would go hiking and camping and climbing and be exposed to very, very big landscapes, very dramatic landscapes where you had to use your body to engage with them, uh, in the atmosphere, in the weather, in rain and in sun, and throughout all uh, weeks of the year. And of course, the, these landscapes have a sublimit, uh, you know, the, they're not really romantic landscapes because they're so kind of tough and picturesque. Um, that, that it leaves you again with a sense of a bigger sense of nature, less of a garden scale nature, more of a, a big sense of geographical nature. And, uh, you know, just beautiful at the same time and serene. And that led to, in a sense, at the same time, an interest in painting and the paintings of English painters like Constable uh, and Turner and others that were very um, capable of capturing the atmospherics of landscape. So again, when you think about it, for me, in my own feeling for landscape, it, it's a very palpable, visceral, experiential medium um, that I think these painters were able to capture, atmosphere more so than just a scenic photograph. Very nice, static, scenic photograph. Everything looks good. But for me, it's much more about the, like, you know, much more visceral, emotional, experiential uh, connection. And even in the paintings of Corot, this is a French painter, but the, the sense of melancholy that's often um, found in landscape, uh, a kind of almost uh, sad quality of loss uh, because landscape is living but it's also dying and um, all, always changing and there's always this sense of optimism about looking forward but also this sense of, of loss and melancholy. Um, and then, you know, about the same time an interest in mapping 
and an interest in cartography. Uh, this is a map by Buckminster Fuller, which is a really interesting map because it is a technique of being able to unfold the surface of a sphere and maintain scale. There's no other projection, there's no other map projection that is able to take the surface of a sphere and make it flat and maintain scale. And what was also interesting about this map is it's possible to unfold it in different ways, uh, which puts continents and countries and geographies into different relationships. And so these little, these little maps here, he calls this one easy to sail to, because it's all <laughs> sea. Whereas another one here is, is where you, he calls it the um, stratosphere strategic, because all of the major continents here are united as one. So it's this idea that if you unfold um, geography in a particular way, you're able to construct different sets of relationships and different sets of possibilities. And uh, at the same time, um, an interest in biology. And uh, I love this image because A, it's biological and it's talking about the, orga the organelles in a cell, the nuclei and the various mitochondria and the various structures that structure the life inside the cell. But it's also really beautiful. And this collusion, in a sense, between geography, biology, and beauty um, is something that, that's always been very uh, compelling to me. At the same time, this was a student work. Um, I guess I fell into landscape architecture because of this interest between geography, biology, and art. But I didn't really understand the conceptual dimensions of landscape architecture at all. And um, I, I really went into landscape architecture thinking it was about land management, really, like forestry management. And there was an, an assignment uh, when I was in my first year in Manchester, so I was 18 or 19 years old. And we were conjoined with architects for the first year. And there was a, this abstract architectural experiment to construct something within a, um, a 40 centimeter cube. That's totally abstract, right? And you don't, I, I just didn't understand what we were doing and why we were doing it. But this was the model that came out of it. It's just a model of making. Uh, it means nothing. It, it has no resonance. It's not rational. But I enjoyed it, and it was a moment of real transformation in just my own thinking. That you could actually make things, uh, and you could actually craft things, and they don't necessarily have to have an explanation or rationale. They could just be beautiful in, in terms of the logic of their own construction. And, you know, eventually an interest in collage and, uh, and cities. So when I graduated as an undergraduate, I worked for Richard Rogers and Partners in London, essentially a firm of architects, looking at this site called the Royal Docks in London. You can see how big it is. And this was, what, 1984, 1985. And um, I remember, I was an intern in the office, they weren't paying me anything. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a very, very small office. And so the partners were young at the time, I guess they're in their late 30s. And um, we would go out for a drink in the evening, and they would confess that they had no idea what they were doing with this project. <laughs> because as architects at the time, they had been trained in buildings at a very particular scale. This scale, they, they couldn't figure it out. And uh, vice versa, when I sat in meetings and there were other professionals around the table, they didn't know what to do with it either. 
So all the architects knew what to do was to maybe build more buildings. All the landscape architects knew what to do was to put trees everywhere. <laughs> all the traffic engineer knew what to do was to just move traffic as quickly as possible through the project. All the real estate people knew what to do was to try to think about a branding narrative to try and sell the development. All that the planners knew what to do was to quantify the ratio of cars to built square footage to open space square footage. There was an ecologist that could only speak about some bird habitat that was over here somewhere in one little location. They were obsessed with this bird habitat. And every time a specialist spoke, everybody else rolled their eyes, they were bored. The architect spoke, nobody cared. The landscape architect spoke, nobody else cared. The bird habitat guy spoke, nobody cared. The traffic guy spoke, nobody cared. There was nobody interested in the whole. And for me, that's the beginning of landscape urbanism. Not at this time, I had no idea. But it, did, it was very striking to me that there were these projects that were coming to life, that were very, very big, complex, multidisciplinary projects, and nobody knew how to handle them. Nobody was taking a holistic, a comprehensive view. And this is it today. It's kind of banani. So then I went to Penn for my master's degree, and I really went for urban design. Um, the guys in London said, hey, if you want to tackle these kinds of projects, go to America, because they seem to be ahead of the game with regards to urban design and urbanism. But I, I didn't quite get into urban, urban design because of this fellow, Ian McCarg, who was a larger-than-life Scotsman and of course had written this book, Design with Nature. And McCarg's passion was truly at a planetary scale. Um, and my training in Manchester had been, I don't know, garden and park scale, maybe, maybe one semester at a regional scale. But, um, and then I would had this experience in the city. And then I was met, met McCarg, and he, of course, was passionate about the planet. And he felt that um, this graph here, that shows the impossibility, really, of population growth, just continuing to grow, 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 at some point, around about here in the mid-2000s, because of um, the limits of water supply, of oil, of food, like the capacity for arable land to continue to produce food. Eventually, resources combined with pollution create an environment where population just has to, by default, begin to fall. And this was just his obsession. Um, how do we create a much more sustainable mode of living? And you could compare this to a book like, um, like this one by uh, Ricky Badet, The Endless City, in which he too is beginning to extrapolate the impossibility <laughs> of numbers. You cannot continue to have population growth at the rate we're having and have our energy and our food and our water and our environment be able to continue to, to survive. And then there's all sorts of interesting um, relationships come out of that in terms of ecosystem issues and McCargian techniques of planning and thinking about systems. So this was an interesting moment because instead of thinking about formal issues of design, we were here beginning to think about systemic issues of design understanding um, the environment not simply as a physical thing that you design and build but as a living system that's caught up in time and some of these techniques were sort of fascinating and interesting and also just the graphic techniques of beginning to work with 
uh, quantities, with materials, and with systems. And then, um, this always interested me too. Um, the idea of how do you actually grow a living system. So what you're looking at here is a, is a forestry plantation scheme that has to do with a very rational and methodical way of creating a forest um, and how you would plant things in a particular system and how these different species would grow and interact in time to actually produce a very, very complex system. And it was a time-based idea, a time-based process. So prior to this, I'd been trained to draw designs in plan and in section and in axonometry. And to look at these designs as really static things that were hopefully beautiful and had experiential dimensions. But here was an idea about thinking about time-based systems. Beginning to think about how you would make um, something that was actually living and never actually had an end state. It was continually in process. And around about that time, uh, Renard Schumi won the Park Level Light competition. Now what interested me with this is that apparently there were 500 entries for this competition in Paris. And almost all of them fell under the rubric of either a picturesque park or a modernist park. The modernist park used straight lines and grids and the picturesque park used curvilinear lines. And this had, was very, um, was less concerned with form. It was more concerned with how the program could be distributed and how you could begin to think of the park now as a system. In this case, not so much a system of ecologies, like air and water and plants, but a system of programs. So the idea was, was that these red kiosks could be built. They would be built empty, but they would later begin to be able to become cafes or restaurants or piano bars or visitor rooms, etc. These alleys and walks would be built as pathways and they would facilitate connectivity across, across the site, etc. So I thought this was pretty interesting because it was very, very fresh at the time. It was new. Nobody had thought of a park like this before. And this was it built. And again, I mean, you can go to it today, and I guess it looks a little old today. Um, but um, at the time, it was incredibly exciting and incredibly innovative. And Bernard Schumi's work it, itself was um, focused around these three ideas. Uh, space, movement, and event. And he said that there is no uh, architecture without event. Uh, we are, this space is hosting an event today. I'm an event. <laughs> and in relationship to this space is how, uh, is how this experience is taking place. We don't just experience space autonomously, just like we don't experience events um, you know, autonomously. They're always situated somewhere in a particular type of space. And I thought this was really fascinating, this idea that space and systems would be always caught up in this idea of people, event, and movement. Uh, and then he created these sorts of dialogues between um, an event, the spatial configuration of the event, and the potential violence that can occur when space um, limits a particular type of event. Uh, and at the same time, these were notational scores um, 
by Maholi Naj and Lacan, but also landscape architects like Lawrence Halprin, who was very interested in choreography and dance, was working with this idea of notational scoring. And what interested me about these is that you could begin to think about time and duration. I'm not going to talk about the High Line today, but the design of the High Line was all about duration. And the experience of the High Line is all about duration. And when everyone, everyone likes to ask me what's my favorite part of the High Line, I don't have a favorite part. It's like a piece of music. You can't say, I have a favorite piece of that music. That the music needs to be understood in its duration and in its journey, in a sense, from one set of spaces and views and vistas and into another set of views and vistas. So, notational scoring was very interesting. Um, and then there were artists like Richard Long. He would draw on a map a series of circles. Each circle has a particular diameter or dimension. And then he would just go and, and take the map and a compass, and he would try and walk that line in the landscape. There was no path, there's no footpath. He's not following a path. He's having to use the map and the compass to actually try and make his way across streams and across rocks and so on. And then he would simply record the incidents that he found. A white owl or a deer, red stones, the first night in the clouds, the peat, the dam, the slow ground, the headwind. It's fantastic stuff. It, it's, it's connecting the idea of duration and um, a linear journey and connecting it to physical experience and to just the encounters, the random encounters of this journey. This map um, is a map drawn to show the story of Napoleon's army. Napoleon's army started out this big, several thousand, three or four thousand soldiers. They marched across France and across in, into Poland. And then they turned back. And the army was sort of cut in size due to battles and to loss of life. Then the battle stopped and they turned back. And at this point there were several, several hundred of them. But as they turned back, they diminish. There's like three or four people make it back. And what happened is they hit the winter. And this is really a story of an army moving and being cut down in size, not so much because of war, but because of the winter and the interrelationship between um, that journey and the experience of winter. So this is interesting too, because it's a really interesting graphic technique that talks about uh, how a quantity is diminished by, in relationship to weather over time. And it's a different graphic representational technique from a plan or a section or an axonometric or a perspective. So if we were all trained, and I think you're all trained, in plans, sections, axonometrics, etc. But that kind of um, technique only allows you to think about space in a fairly static way. And I became really interested in notations and charts and graphics because they were useful tools to begin to think about systems and encounters and time, really time-based ideas, um, which to me had a relationship to landscape. This is a famous drawing by Louis Kahn for streets in Philadelphia where he likened the streets to rivers. And he said, all of these cars here are, are in a primary river. We could begin to think about streets as becoming uh, streams and then canals 
and then parking structures that he called harbors. So all of the all of the boats on the river, if you will, begin to coalesce into the space of the harbor. So it, it, it's simply looking at drawing streets, but instead of drawing streets in plan and delineating them with dimension, he's actually here drawing the processes or the actants or the, or the individual components that, that fill those streets with life, which led to the idea of these parking garages becoming harbors, cylindrical uh, constructions. Um, another Lavillette influence, of course, was uh, the Cool House OMA scheme. Um, again, because you get a really intriguing plan that isn't exactly picturesque or modern, but it is actually a framework for growing program. Now, this was his phrase at the time, growing program. I showed you an image for growing trees. I thought it's really interesting to think not only in terms of ecosystems, but also in terms of urban programs. How could you begin to set up, uh, in this case, a series of strips or bands that would be built fairly empty, and that over time they would begin to fill in and the idea was is that you would begin to have what they called a montage of effects. In other words, there's a cowboy in a sand field alongside a tractor with a field, alongside a, a, a formal garden, alongside an agricultural landscape, etc. That this idea of just moving transversely along that line would take you through a surreal set of encounters, a surreal set of experiences. And that, that begins to point to an idea for landscape urbanism now. Because instead of thinking about landscape as the green <coughs> stuff, the countryside outside of the city, or just the green parks inside the city, what if you could think of, um, of the city or of, of, a, of a landscape that is simultaneously city and landscape. It's almost impossible. I mean, is this diagram a city or is it a landscape? Is it a park or is it an urban framework? It's, it's both. It, it is a park and it will be green and there will be trees, but there will also be buildings and programs, and the whole modus operandi of, the, of this is to create a framework that allows programs and, and living systems to coexist. So then you get uh, um, to Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre Broad City, his vision for Broadacre City. This is just a detail of the plan. And what's really interesting here is that you're seeing water systems, green systems, parks, paths, uh, built systems, buildings, housing, workspace, infrastructural systems in terms of water for drinking water. Everything <laughs> is integrated as one texture, one fabric, one image. And this, to me, is a landscape urbanist uh, vision, where the city is not simply um, something that architects do that stuff, and landscape architects do that stuff, and the traffic planners do that stuff. But it's actually conceived of more holistically. Uh, and there are other, other influences. Um, this is Le Corbusier's plan for the Venice Hospital. And when you look at the plan, it's a really interesting uh, construction where it's less a building as an object and it's now a building as a landscape. Because what you begin to see is that the building plan and the movement systems 
are exactly how we would think about a landscape. It's not an object. It's a more porous and more interconnected system. Um, around about the same time, you look at a project by Peter Eisenman. Uh, this was what, 1990 or something. And what Peter Eisenman was doing at this time was what he called a kind of archaeology. And what he was trying to do was to look at projects archaeologically in terms of how various layers could carry memory. So let's say the Shumi and the Cool House projects for Lavalette were purely program driven. Eisenman was working with layers and systems too, but he was wanting these layers to carry with them memory, like a kind of an archaeology. And I thought this was really interesting, that you could begin to think about um, forming landscape textures that were program driven and system driven and time based, but they could also carry with them a sense of place because they could carry with them memory and, and archaeology. This was his plan for a garden at La Villette, for example. Little story here. Being a typical egotistical architect, Peter Eisenman has a very big ego. This project for, the, for Venice created these cubes. And this was before Shumi and Lavalle. And Eisenman believed that Shumi created the red follies after he created these things. So when he was invited to create a garden at Lavalette, he reconstituted the city wall. He reconstituted the plan of the park on a floated plane. He cut out a sort of archaeological hole, and then he replaced his Venice uh, pavilions. So it's memory and ego at the same time. <laughs> but it's really beautiful, and it's really intriguing, and it um, uh, was for me very influential at the time to think about how to think about design now, not simply as plans and sections and compositions, but as layered systems that were coordinating program living systems, and now the idea of memory, the idea of an archaeology of memory. And there were other urban thoughts. This was part of the Situationist movement. Um, and if any of you know anything about the Situationists, they, they were very interested in the idea of the journey in a city. When you go on a walk in, in the city, you have a set of encounters and they were fascinated with this. The idea that any of you go out tonight and walk around, you're going to have a set of encounters. And for the situationists, that was the whole idea of life in the city. That the fun of being in the city is to have these random encounters. And they produced a set of maps, a little bit like the Richard Long journeys, except these were much more urbanistic and produced a set of maps and a set of studies about encounters in the city. So then we begin to get more towards a, a landscape urbanist um, view now. This is an old map of Manhattan, lo lower part of Manhattan. You can see, you see the different grids. Those grids are setting out the plots, the frameworks for the city to grow as well as the roads and the streets and the subway systems, the infrastructures are built into this diagram. If you took that plan, you could overlay it on the landscape outside of Munich. When you fly into Munich and look out of the window, you see agricultural fields and beautiful landscapes. This is very similar 
geometrical formation. Landscape urbanism, a framework, a geometrical framework that facilitates growth. So when the, when the farmers plat out their land for agriculture, they're setting out a framework for the um, seasonal and varied uh, work of agriculture. When the urbanist does it in the city, they're setting out a framework for buildings to grow and for the city to actually begin to take on a life. And if you look at any one of these blocks, all of these blocks are exactly the same at this scale. But when you look at what happens, they all get built out very differently. Different developers, different architects, different buildings. Here you have one large building. <laughs> Here you have some linear buildings. Here you have a series of very, very small buildings with, with end walls on the avenues. It allows for a differentiation between the north-south avenue with bigger buildings and the east-west streets with a very fine grain of buildings. It led to the early development of Manhattan with these being mostly the commercial buildings on the avenues and these mostly being the residential and, sm and smaller shop buildings on the streets. And look at that. <laughs> Just massive. It's a framework, a landscape framework, I would argue, that allows for a city to actually grow and to evolve. And when you begin to look at the larger American landscape, um, when I moved to America, I was sort of fascinated with the American landscape. It's unlike anything you see in Europe. And so when you get up into the air and you can actually see it, it like, it's like massive. Um, this is a, a landscape where you actually have the grid, the survey grid. But this grain here are actually uh, glacial soil deposits from the glaciation period. So they've actually created um, different soils. The different soils have different degrees of wetness and dryness, which means that the farmer, when he's on a flat piece of land, can farm it one way. When he's on the grain of land, it, they have to think about how they farm differently because the soils are different. And, you know, you begin to look at that in a map form, you get the contours and you get the different um, conditions of the land with this overlay of the grid. So this interaction now, if you will, between, be, between the overlay of the system, the framework, and the underlay of the land itself. One of the very interesting things about the American grid is it was really done for a very, very pragmatic reason, and that was to allow settle, settlers to have a legally defined plot of land. Because what was happening is that people were going west, and they were trying to create a farm, and then that farm w was easily stolen or taken from them. It was very difficult to have defined property. So the system actually allows for a very equitable settlement of the land. And then because there are so many varied geomorphological conditions, um, even though it's a grid, you actually get very, very different landscapes from one place to the next to the next because the geography is very different. <coughs> so when people tell you that grids are boring, because that's what you get told. You'll draw a grid and you'll be told that's boring. I would argue with that. I should think grids are fascinating because they can produce an, a, a really rich tapestry of difference uh, because of this interaction with systems over time. And of course, there are old things in America too. And then what, what happens with landscape to go back to the Eisenman reference, 
is you do get layers of memory. So here, for example, this is a pivot irrigator. This is a line that goes deep into the ground to tap the ground water. And it draws water up, and there's a beam here that rotates around the field, and it irrigates the field with water drawn up from the ground. But you can see that just because of the history of how this land has actually been farmed, it becomes a memory, a memory field. It's like there's a lot of layers here. It's not just a circle. There's a lot of uh, archaeology here in the, in, the, in the legibility of the layers. Which led to another thought, which is um, the paintings of, say, Robert Rauschenberg. Robert Rauschenberg was famous for painting on the flat. Instead of painting standing up with a vertical canvas, his canvases would be on, on, a, on a table, and he would walk around them, kind of paint them like this, and, and work with them on the flat. And they're called flatbeds, like a flatbed truck. And his method of painting was what he calls um, a method of just pure pure discovery and layering and accident. And I thought this was interesting too. Because as a method of working, in a sense you're creating layers and each layer begins to interact with another and this idea of systems. But also, it allows you to maybe discover something. So as a mode of being at your design desk and trying to think of something, instead of trying to draw little plans and draw compositions, what if you were to actually engage in a process that allowed you to think of possibilities and to do it in a sort of flatbed-like way? And this was um, uh, something I produced. We called it the Alshow flatbed. It's actually a massive light table. And you can see here there's all these overlays of plans and maps and records. It's the archaeology of the site. And just being sifted around on a, on a table to kind of begin to do research, but also to look for possibilities. And it's a beautiful sort of thing in terms of how, uh, how various ideas are recorded. Uh, which leads to this idea of a mess. Do you know what a mess is in English? A mess. A big mess. <laughs> so, this is a mess, right? But I think that's what any project is. Any project you're working on is a mess. Uh, you've got a lot of information, you've got a lot of maps, you have a lot of things you need to be thinking about. The client is always a complication. <laughs> but also now, because we're in the public realm, it's a mess, right? So, for example, uh, in a project we have in Seattle, we have to go and make public presentations and public meetings. And you're dealing with the, in, the industries, the industries, the shippers and the builders. All they want to do is move trucks from A to B as fast as possible. They're not interested in public space. You have the entrepreneurs who are interested in development. They can invest and they can make money. You have the neighbors who hate these guys and hate these guys because the neighbors like it, like it just the way it is. You have uh, the business owners, the tribes. These are the Native American tribes. A lot of people in America have a lot of guilt about how they treated Native American tribes. And the tribes themselves, therefore, have a lot of power. This is another kind of mess. It, not unlike the Rauschenberg flatbed. It's a mess. <laughs> 
and as a landscape architect making a presentation to an audience that have very different um, agendas, you have to be able to work through this mess. And you have to be able to have the imagination that allows you to do it. This diagram is really interesting. Uh, it talks about how you try to organize messes, right? Any business is a mess. You have a lot of people. So you look at um, Facebook, for example. It's organized in a, in a very polycentric way. There's a lot of different individuals who are working in the Facebook organization. If you look at Amazon, it's very hierarchical. There's a, there's a guy at the top, and he has two, two, two vice presidents. And then you have four vice vice presidents. And then you have all of the people at the bottom. These people answer to them, they answer to them, they answer to them, they answer to them, and they answer to them. In Apple, Steve Jobs is in the middle. <laughs> and everybody, he's getting all the inputs from everybody. That's really an interesting model. You know, do you run an organization hierarchically, or do you run an organization um, sort of centrally? Uh, I like this one, Microsoft, because what happened at Microsoft is that the software team went over there, and the hardware team went over there, and the marketing team went over there. They never spoke to one another. They pointed guns at one another, and <laughs> blamed one another for everything that went wrong. So this is really interesting, because it really has to do with how you organize um, complexity. Not only the complexity of the natural systems, water, trees, ecology, not only the organization of the programming, the events and the programs that you're having to work with, whether it's housing or open space or whatever, but also the organization of all of this chaos that surrounds any project. A project needs organizing, and you have to organize it differently according to the characteristics of the project. Um, where am I going here? I have to remember where the hell I'm going. Uh, another image, really interesting. Do you know what it is? Anyone know what this is? It is indeed, it's skin, and these are little sweat globules. And if you can uh, animate this, uh, as the skin gets warmer, the globules will get bigger, and then they will begin to evaporate, and they cool the skin. As the skin gets cooler, these will disappear. So what you're looking at here is a, is a reactive surface that is using the water to cool and warm the surface of the skin. Now let's imagine this now as a landscape. What if we were to begin to think about making landscapes that had the same capacity to adjust, uh, to self-regulate? and to begin to, again, think about these surfaces that we're talking about as a system of self-regulation. And something that's a, a much more of a biological idea of a surface. Uh, and a surface that is understood in time. A, a sort of a time-based or evolving surface. And working, um, this was a scheme for a paving, a pavement, and we're working with um, both hard and soft to create a single surface. So instead of a, a, pave, a, a plaza and a garden, two separate systems, what if we were to create one system where the paving and the garden became one? 
and it, it, it begins to become a sort of a, a new skin, if you will. <sighs> so Downsview Park was a big competition in um, around about 1999. And I think that this, in a sense, was a park that put a lot of these things together. It was an attempt to try to produce a new kind of park that was actually an ecologically informed park in terms of uh, soils and hydrology and biodiversity, but also an idea for how this park could be grown in time so that the, the, the park could be built with the budget that they had at that moment in time but we would set up the systems that would allow that park to grow or biodiversify in time and become more complex. It's sort of an ecological equivalent to the Lavalette project, I show if, if the Lavalette frameworks were intended to um, support programs and activities and events, this park was really about more natural systems, ecosystems. And LifeScape, which is our big project for fresh fields. Um, and we called it LifeScape instead of Landscape. This was a competition. And the other four schemes produced landscapes. Two of those landscapes looked like um, Louis V. <laughs> with axes. I mean, this site is so big. The notion of big axes is, is crazy. But two of them went that, in that direction, and the other two went in a, a central park direction. Both of them, both of those approaches to create a landscape, in my view, were wrong. Because this site is too big and too complicated and too expensive for either one of those visions to ever be realized. We believe that you would need to grow a park over time. And that's why we called it LifeScape. We use this image of sort of a, a, a biological image in what is roughly the plan of the site. And it took on a slightly, what I like about this image, it takes on a slightly amoebic form. It looks like it's an organism. Which led to a problem later on. Because when we tried to use this image to brand the park, some politician got it into their heads that this looked like a fetus. And they were an anti-abortion politician. <laughs> and so we lost the image. <laughs> image had to go. Because they thought it was an aborted fetus. This is what I mean about a mess. <laughs> and um, this, is, this is sort of one of the landfills of Fresh Kills. And you can see, I mean, that, this is nearly one mile long. And you can see that it's, it's actually a very engineered system. And so there's a lot of challenges here about how, how do you make a lens? How do you possibly make a lens? <laughs> it's just impossible. And so we had an idea that you would need to grow a landscape over time that you would begin by creating soil, by growing very, very fast growing organic plants, like kale, and every three months you would plow that in, and that would begin to create an organic soil. Because otherwise we would have to spend, I think the calculation was five years of trucks coming every 15 minutes with soil. So rather than that, we thought we could make the soil over a period of time. And this is just the scale of the site and this idea of, of growing or cultivating, colonizing a site over a period of time. So you see, you know, 
it's a way of thinking about landscape in a time-based way, where you're trying to grow the system. At the same time, there are some smaller projects where you do need to go back to the plan and the section and be very precise about the, the uh, geometries and the elements that are going to build certain things. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying do not work with plans and sections and so on. I'm saying just diversify your toolbox with, with, with the toolbox that allows you to think and realize that at some point you do need to be very precise and quite architectural in terms of how you work with geometry and with, with components. But there's also this living material that is always very time-based and will always begin to grow. For example, there's a weed on the site called Phragmites, which is a big grass. It's very, very aggressive. It's almost impossible to get rid of. So we told the client to get a herd of goats. And the goats eat the Phragmites. That's not something you can draw in a plan, it's not something you can, you can draw as a design, but it is a really interesting tool to begin to allow for this site to be, uh, to be worked. So you begin to think about the city now as a living organism, as a living biology. This was a project we did for the city of Rotterdam, looking at its various um, inputs, its various energy flows. Uh, a project for a city in China that is organized around these big five fingers. These fingers have streams coming into them of mostly polluted water. So these are big parks, but they're also water processing machines. And that allows us then to create five sectors for the city. Each, uh, each sector has its own transit uh, hub associated with a civic space. One, two, three, four, five. On a loop underneath, that's the mobility loop. And then we, we have this, this whole thing for how these green fingers go. And we're doing a similar thing in, in the harbour of Hong Kong with a big new park, but also integrating that park back into the city. And you could say that when you get to the high line, you know, there's a lot of thematics that I've talked about that are reified in the high line too, um, that work at a different scale, but the idea of duration, the idea of time-based systems, and now the idea of the theatricality of social life. So those encounters I talked about, when you go on a walk and you have a set of encounters, how through design can you begin to dramatize uh, and intensify those, those types of experience? I'm going to leave it there because I, I want to talk about the projects. Not, not really, this morning should not be about our projects. This morning should be more about a set of ideas uh, in landscape architecture, in urbanism, that hopefully provoke you all to think a little bit about your own experiences, your own experiences in the city, what you like about living in the city, your own experiences of, of the natural landscapes, of mountains and lakes, your own thoughts about um, how you design and how you think, um, the, re the interrelationship between formal design, where you're creating form, and system, a systems approach, where you're beginning to think about the system, the, the living aspect. Uh, how you begin to think about time, because our medium is inevitably time-based, and how you begin to think about projects, and the mess, and the complexity, and the unique characteristics that surround each project. Because each project is different, in a sense you have to have a different response.
uh, in our portfolio of work, for example, we don't we don't have a style. Uh, we don't have a design style. And that's because every project is different, and it demands a different way of thinking. Uh, and what I tried to show you is a kind of a, a catalog of <coughs> impressions, thoughts, and ideas that begin to build this box, this toolbox, that helps you because when you encounter these different types of project, you need to draw from different, uh, from different sets of ideas. So with that, we'll take uh, questions and discussion. I, I, would, I would really like that. And you can ask anything at all. It can relate to this, or it can relate to this, or it can be anything. Thank you.